Hi, I'm Podrick Regan, and this is Some Integrity, my debut collection which has just been published by Carcanet. I want to begin by reading the first poem in this book. It's called 50 Milliliters of India Ink. Opaque and black as gravity, the ink is perfectly unlike the small glass pot whose shape it occupies so passively. It is something's burnt remains that makes it black. It is the sticky leavings of the lac bug that makes it shine. The name of the lac bug has nothing to do with absence, but means, in fact, a multitude. It performs its tiny, fractal creep through the paper's knitted capillaries and finds itself astounded with significance. It means, I am not yet dead. I was not untempted to leave this blank. I wanted to read that poem because I think it acts as a kind of preface to the collection as a whole. Many of the techniques and concerns that run throughout the book are condensed into that one poem. This poem started actually as a commission from Belfast School of Art, who asked me to write in response to a picture of St Matthew the Evangelist and the Angel by Jan van Bylert, a 17th century Dutch painter. And at first I kind of struggled with this commission. I find it very difficult to get a grip on the image, to find, I guess, the punctum in the image that would allow me to write about it. And then I realised something which was actually quite obvious about the picture, which is that I was asked, I was being asked to write about a picture which itself depicted an act of writing. And once I realised that, I noticed a gesture in the image. There's a very young angel in this picture who is handing St Matthew a pot of ink and St Matthew is reaching his pen, reaching over and dipping his pen into the ink that the angel offers him. And this made me think about how writing is always a kind of inscription of bodily presence. No matter what a text means, no matter what a text says, it is always saying that a body once existed in the world. But you'll notice that there's quite a lot of negation in this poem. And negation is, I guess, a technique and a principle that I'm deeply interested in. I'm interested in how, in a poem, if you say that something isn't there, it introduces a kind of strange ontological doubleness. The thing is both present and not present at the same time. When I was writing this poem, I was also doing a lot of drawing, using in particular India ink, which is a mixture of um, a very fine ash or soot diluted with water and then bound together with shellac, which is a product um, excreted by these insects called lac bugs. And there's a lot of poems in this book that deal with questions about visual art. One of my big obsessions is I guess, the mechanics of image making. How is it that three-dimensional spaces and objects get translated onto the two-dimensional surface of the page? I'm going to read another poem, which I think is doing something similar to the first, um, but moves on to some other concerns of the book. This is called Study of a Tomato. Imagine it. Substantial as a planet and twice as red. Begin with this. Establish an outline, round as ontology, but solid, filled with as much tomato as it can hold. It has no bones, no beak, no claws. Its form is soft and softer. It is mostly juice, which is not blood and not unlike it. It has and is, like everything, a body. Let's open it. Here is the pulp in which your tongue might read the season's rainfall and map the land it fell upon. Here are the seeds to which it's so devoted. And here is that little green nipple you've likely by now plucked out, which implies the vine and all its red brethren. It does not speak. It is not a symbol for menstruation or the absence thereof. This is this and only this. In addition to visual art, I guess food is the other big obsession of this book. I've been writing about food for as long as I've been writing. My interest in food first began really as an interest in still life pictures, and there's a whole section in this book called Still Lifes. But I guess over time my interest in food has deepened. I'm, in, I'm, 
I'm intrigued by how food can, I guess, encode an attitude towards economics and consumption. But I'm also interested in how food and how the very material act of eating reminds us about some reminds us of something about our own bodies, which is that our bodies are not hermetic, sealed, enclosed systems. They are permeable, they are penetrable, they are things that we are constantly making and remaking. And for me, this is a way of exploring a particular kind of queer embodiment. You'll notice that in this poem, I'm speaking about menstruation or its absence. I think of this poem as one that tries to express a kind of indeterminacy of gender. I'll read one more poem from the last section of the book. This is called A Forest in the Czech Republic. Where fungus doesn't knit itself into the mulch or cluster on the roots like scabs. Where I am not and not writing this. Where I do not hear the wind carve through the spaces the trees don't occupy. Where a hole chiselled in a trunk does not resemble the hole in a guitar. Where snow is not falling, and snow is not resisting its effacement in the streams. Where no boys are swimming, and the nymphs of no mayflies build their adult selves. Where God is. Where branches run like cracks through the pink sky, dividing it according to their own bent logic. Where the long vacated shells of chestnuts would catch the rain if it rained. Where rain would shatter the surface of the streams where some boy swam some time ago. This isn't hypothetical. I wrote this poem after reading some work by an environmental philosopher called Timothy Morton, who makes a very interesting argument, uh, which is that in order to properly think ecologically, we need to do away with the concept of nature. Nature, Morton argues, is always a way of removing the human from the systems of the ecological systems with which we are inextricably bound up. And this was an idea that really appealed to me because nature is a concept that I've always struggled with. I've always thought that nature was, well, first of all, exactly that, a concept, a category that we make from within a position of culture. And it seems to me that nature is, a, is an idea that has always been weaponized against queer people. We've always been told that our desires, our ways of being in the world, our modes of embodiment are either contrary to nature, or if you go back through history, are seen as too natural, as insufficiently cultured. So I'm interested in how we might be able to, I guess, do ecology, how we might be able to actually face up to the damage that we are inflicting upon our planet. Um, while still avoiding some of the, as I see it, heteronormative cliches of nature and nature conservation. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be reading more poems from this book and having a conversation about it with Stephen Sexton on the 26th of January, and I hope to see as many of you there as possible. Thank you.